welcome to the Skiffy and Fanti Show. Corollary number one. Like stories, time wants to tell itself. I like that. That's a good part to pick out. I'm Sean. I'm Brandon. And today we are obviously joined by the inspiring writer and editor, Nisi Shaw, winner of the James Tiptree Jr. Award for their short story collection, Filter House, co-author with Cynthia Ward of Writing the Other, Bridging Cultural Differences for Successful Fiction, editor of New Sons 2, original speculative fiction by people of color, and many short stories and other great things as well. And today we are talking about their new novel out from Tor, which is Kidding, the sequel to 2016's Everfair. Welcome to the show, Nisi. Hi, glad to be here. This is your first time on our show, by the way. Yes, yes. Really? Yeah, we've Remind never had Nisi on. I'm, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so glad because I wanted to so do this I. before, but then I was too scared. Um, <laughs> but I'm not scared anymore. I, I am a brave a brave little interviewer now. So I, I've mm-hmm. gained some interview points. So uh, uh, there's one last thing, Brandon, you want to let folks know, and then we will dive into questions for Nisi. Yes, before we begin, a friendly reminder to everyone listening and watching uh, that we like to hear from you. So if you would like to talk to us about this and past episodes, you can do that at skiffyandfanty.com slash listener suggestions. Uh, you can also join us on Discord, where we talk all the time and would like to listen to other people talk instead of just us. Um, and you can also become a Patreon supporter, so you can financially support the show and um, actually be able to more directly engage with the kind of content that we make for the podcast. Uh, and also, if you're live with us today on Twitch, please feel free to ask questions, give your thoughts uh about Everfair, uh, and uh, continue to engage with us as we and uh, engage with this interview. So we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. Absolutely. All right, so Nisi, the first question, the big one, uh, well, it's not the big one, it's, it's a big question, I suppose, which is, uh, tell us about Kinning. What, what is this book? This book is weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that is, has been my takeaway. Um, it is a, a sequel to Everfair, as in it takes place in the year immediately after the end of Everfair. Um, and it includes several characters from Everfair, uh, Bilung and Tink, um, Princess Mwadi, Prince Ilunga. Uh, there, there are some others, uh, some overlap. Uh, and... The thing, though, is that I tell people also that, okay, there's going to be a third book, Trulies, and I I know a little bit about it already. So, but Everfair, you could think of that as sort of a standalone, and then Kinning and Trulies as two parts of the same book set in the Everfair universe. Oh. Maybe. Um, and notice how I skillfully avoided saying what happens <laughs> in Kinning. Uh, shall I shall I rectify that now? Sure. Yeah. Give us like the what's the what's the basic story for folks that maybe haven't read it. Yeah. Uh, why can you even do that? Because it's a complicated. Yeah, I, I'm trying to <laughs> wrap my head around the idea of a basic story here. So um, what happens is. There's a revolution worldwide, um, and to help it along, Tink and Bi Lung uh, take an air canoe around a certain route and try and and distribute the spores of this empathy-inducing fungus uh, that people can ingest and uh, get pretty close to telepathy, um, more like telepathy, more, more empath- empathy than 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 thoughts, um, and uh, some other sort of superpowers. And then, and then things go horribly right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good place, actually, for the a, a question I had to ask about, which is okay. these spores, right? These empathy inducing spores that I, I 
I don't know that I've seen, I, I mean, like, you said weird when you were first describing the book. And normally fungus would be like, oh, this is weird territory because fungus are weird. And and yet this this is a a weird concept in a very fun and interesting way. And I was kind of curious where initially my, my first question is kind of where did that kind of come from? This idea of an empathy inducing spore that can be spread around to create, as you say, I'll borrow your word, uh, telepathy, essentially. Uh, well, um, so I was doing some reading as, you know, us nerds are prone to doing. Uh, and I was reading about something called the Wood Wide Web, not the World Wide Web, but the Wood Wide Web. And that is where uh, the roots of trees in a forest communicate via uh, fungal uh, inter intermixing. Um, like they'll have like uh, fungal uh, sheaths around their roots or um, they, they are stretching between them. And this is not just limited to, you know, one species. It's like oaks talking to beech and uh, you know, conifers talking to deciduous trees, everybody's getting in on this wood wide web. So I thought that might be a nice way of, of uh, communicating between different nations, different people, because it's, it's uh, so to use the proper meaning of the word, so Catholic, so universal. Uh, mm. But the other place that I got this idea from was from a book that I have not read because I do not uh, know how to read Mandarin. Um, it is a Chinese uh, anarchist uh, science fiction novel from the early 20th century. And oh. in it, um, yeah, in it, the, these... Um, Chinese anarchists um, distribute something called spirit medicine, which uh, inclines people to become socialists. Yeah, that sounds yeah. like medicine for these spirits, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I, I, I wanted to see, you know, if I could could invoke that also. Mm -hmm. So you and guys it was one. You ha sorry, you haven't heard about the Chinese anarchists with the no. spirit medicine? No, that's a book that I'd very much like to read, in fact. Well, do you read Mandarin? Not I do yet. Not. <laughs> but it surely has... someone must have translated it right. No this sounds like has... the perfect book to translate. No one has translated it yet. If I had the money, I would be paying a translator now because I really want to read it. Yeah, Sounds exciting, and especially yeah. like the frame in the book that I enjoyed so very much is the idea that, um, the abilities that one gets from that fungus also include the ability to tell whether someone is lying to you. Yes. <laughs> um, and I found that like using that in this political sense is actually very interesting because it's not only that it's uh empathetic powers are allowing you to be more um tightly uh emotionally connected to those around you but that in political settings you can't be easily swayed by rhetoric in those kinds of circumstances um so you are simultaneously more likely to buy into your own groups and less likely to be won over by someone else's in this kind of interplay that I thought was really interesting as a frame. Uh, I kind of wanted to pick your brain about that in particular, using it in this political sense, like what was, um, like, what is the narrative goal? What do you want re readers to like feel and think about the ways in which they engage with other people politically um, through the use of spirit medicine in the work? Oh, I want them to experiment with different ways of relating to one another. Um, because um, while it is true um, most of the time, and uh, it is the belief of many of the people who've taken the spirit medicine that they can tell when someone's lying, if someone believes what they're saying, 
they're going to smell like they're telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And so someone who is a convinced uh, QAnon believer, for instance, they would not smell like they were lying because they would not believe that they were lying. Um, so there is so is there is that. Um, there are also um, people who find it, um, that kind of connection too intense and too smothering. Um, so I I, it's not that I want one particular outcome for people who uh, are are for characters who are embracing the spirit medicine, but I I want them to be involved in it. I want them to to figure out what it means for them. I t I talk about my characters as if they're real people. Sorry, some of us writers do that, right? Uh, yeah. Quite a few, actually. <laughs> I think it's I think it's one of the most normal things about writing at this point. <laughs> if that's one of the normal things, I'm afraid of everything else. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I actually had a question about um, the format of the novel as well, because you you said that it was a weird book, and especially format wise. Um, I am inclined to agree. Uh, like I, I like when books are very peculiarly formatted. So I love the fact that, for instance, um, every few chapters is broken by an by uh a brief interlude, um, and the fact that there are appendices at the back of the book that are less about the world itself and more about the act of engaging with history in the way that we are reading the book. Um, mm. and especially the imaginary chapters were a thing <laughs> that I wanted to ask you about because it is very much about not only imagining what could be in the book, but asking the reader to think deeply about the act of reading and the act of thinking very deeply about history as an object. Um, in asking the reader to essentially imagine what would fill the spaces in between the book as they are reading it. And I really wanted to uh, ask you, like, what was the impetus for framing that particular section in that way? Uh, like, what inspired that actual idea and what was the goal for it, for the reader to get from that? Mathematics. Ooh. The, the, the frame for this book and... Don't ask me why it's this, but it is mathematics. Um, so are, you were reading um, from the, the corollaries and then mm -hmm. there are um, the, the interludes are W, X, Y, and Z, which are, they're, they're uh, uh, variables in, in mathematical e equations and um, Imaginary chapters, imaginary numbers. Ah. Ah. And then there's chapter zero. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. it goes from there. Oh, no, you weren't reading the corollaries. You were reading the axioms. Sorry. Yeah. Right, yes. No. Uh, no, I was reading the uh, corollaries, in fact. Oh, you were? Okay. All right. So, yeah, it starts out with axioms, moves through the story, and then goes to corollaries. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm going to do something similar, but with a different discipline for Trulies. Ooh. Um, hmm. Maybe some other structure uh, or format, like maybe uh, recipes. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But this one definitely uh, is mathematical. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm glad that you got something else out of it. <laughs> no, yeah, like uh, even like, even with that acknowledgement, the, the sections themselves, the text itself is still very engaging. Um, but like even because it sounds as if that was something that just kind of struck you without like necessarily having a conscious goal and now I'm thinking more deeply that perhaps you had an inspirational thought that occurred there about how these things come together that 
uh, is not it doesn't emerge obviously through reading. It, it emerges less obviously through the reading. And now I'm curious to just kind of go back again and study these parts more and like try to figure out what that is because I thought it was really uh, inviting actually. Oh, Again, good. I like it. I like it when sections do weird things. Like the fact that the imaginary chapters are asking me to essentially uh consider what is happening after the things that you have described to me is actually really uh enticing to me as a reader. It's telling me that my reading is part of the work. Yes, yeah. yes, it is. Absolutely. Uh what I was reading an interview with uh someone yeah. who um, th they had they had been a sound engineer for Prince, and oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> right, and then they started uh, attending school uh, and uh, got a degree in in neurology, a combined degree in neurology and music. And one of their um, assertions that I firmly believe is that music does not exist without listeners, and mm -hmm. I would uh, extend that to fiction. Stories do not exist without an audience. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, getting into that. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Well, this this leads me to one of the questions I, I really wanted to ask about, because you'd mentioned the axioms, which kind of give us some of the, the central shifts that have occurred in the, the world to give us this alternate history. And then this is followed by your, you know, the first of your imaginary, uh, the, the, this imaginary chapters section, which gives us even kind of more of, of that uh, sense of what makes this world so different. And I thought this was an interesting tactic because in a lot of alternate history that I've read, um, and I, I'm certainly not super well versed, but but a lot of it I've read, we kind of have to figure out what's different about the world. Sometimes it's not that hard. It's like, ah, like World War Two, but like the other guy won. Um, which is, you know, a little obvious. Uh, and so uh, I, I kind of was was curious in, in approaching making an alternate history, especially one where the focus of the shift is maybe not the place we usually think of as a space for alternate history. I'm, I'm really curious about what was the impetus for that and also like the challenges of kind of deviating from the world we actually know and making this different one. Well, that actually gets back to Everfair because Kinning really does follow along uh, the events of Everfair. But the initial um, deviation was with the founding of the London School of Economics by the Fabian Socialists, this British group. Hmm. Um, what they did was they had uh, some sort of inheritance, some large bundle of cash, and um, they used it to found the London School of Economics. But in my version, instead, they use it to buy a bunch of land from Leopold II of Belgium, because Leopold had, you know, he just like commandeered all this huge region of Africa uh, along the Congo River, the Congo River Basin, um, because he wanted wealth. So just give them the wealth and, you know, proceed. And then that's what happened in Everfair. Uh, but just changing one thing like that really changes the trajectory of history. Uh, so that I found that, um, for instance, I had to change the outcome of World War I. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then... I looked at the effects that World War I had on our country, and it, they were huge. They were huge in terms of feminism. They were huge in terms of, like, the, the Harlem Renaissance came out of the, uh, out of the outcome of World War I. So, yeah, the challenge. Talk about the challenge. Um, and then... Um, as I continue with Kinning, um, I do some things as far as uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, um, the Chinese anarchist movement. Uh, the May 4th movement, by the way, is an actual historically uh, true uh, anarchist movement. Um, 
but I just gave them a little more room to to uh, run work with. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know what else. Oh, the flu. Oh gosh, the flu. That was a big one for me um, because the I, there's there's controversy as to where the influenza epidemic um, that took place at the end of World War I, where it got started um, and how it got started. But by making the uh, people of color in this time, in this timeline, more resistant to it because they had been exposed to a milder related version um, that changed the whole geopolitics, right? And I I extended that uh, to Kinning, including like the erroneous assumption of what caused the um, resistance. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's a there's a question in in chat from from Paul, and and I think this is a question I would have asked too. Is you know as you make these changes, you hinted a little earlier that suddenly there's almost like a cascade right that that if you're yes. really trying to make it all work like you know and as we get into this novel right you now have all the time from the previous novel then all the time in this book for even more change to occur as a consequence of you know the butterfly effect as they sometimes call it and as a as a writer did you how do you try to keep that coherent uh i guess for the reader or even for yourself as the writer yeah. since you've got it all in your head if you can, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I don't know that I kept it coherent for some people. Let's just say uh, the book has its critics, and um, I cannot I cannot fault those who find it uh, difficult to follow because I was making color coded charts for myself, right? <laughs> you know, and and like spreadsheets of like who got this. Uh, influenza when and who got the spirit medicine and who got the uh, Russian cure, which is the rival for it. And when did they have both? I mean, yeah, it, it takes some tracking just for the events of that novel, let alone um, for the two novels. I did uh, make, okay, so Everfair is like 30 years. Um, Kinning is is a year and a half. So I did like just focus on a narrower uh, time range. So at least I had that going for me. But otherwise, I am not using any software. I'm using like legal pads and mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> History oh. done the natural way like everyone else. <laughs> so, sorry, I'm, I was talking. I didn't. Oh, you're doing history the natural way like everyone oh, else. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm sure by the time I get to the third book, I will have figured out something else that will help. Mm -hmm. One of the follow-up questions to this says, is more a practical question. If someone's going to read Everfair for the first time, do you personally think the the written te the, the print text or the audio version is your would be your preference? That's a really hard one. Uh, I would say that people learn in different ways. They process information in a variety of ways. Um, one person I know actually listened to the book while reading it. And that that was their their method. Um, I pr prefer to read things because then I can like stop and go back and find what I was looking at before. But not necessarily, you, it's easier to do that, in fact, with an electronic book than it is with uh, a, a print book, because you can just search on a word, you know, where, where, where am I seeing a uh, hash mark? You know, I remember that was part of the passage. Um, so, yeah, I will say that I adore Alison Johnson, who was the reader for both the Kinning and the Everfair audiobooks. Uh, Allison is very, very careful and um, 
she she looks for the correct pronunciation of all of these names that are like not in English. Um, all the place names, all the character names, um, terms that I, you know, I just wrote them. I wouldn't have thought that they required research, but apparently they do. <laughs> um, so I I do recommend the audiobooks highly. Um, but as to as to whether I recommend them over the printed versions, I leave that as an exercise to the audience. Ah, great. I will say personally, uh, I was reading the book as an ebook on the plane, uh, and I got to this point where I was like, I I, I need the book in my hand. I need to be able, because I find it a little easier for me to like flip back and forth between the pages uh, and to remember passages by like seeing the way the page looks, the way the lines are laid out. I can remember okay. pages that way. And so I was at the Minneapolis airport. Like, I know there's two bookstores in the in here. It, it's got to be in here somewhere and it was not and i was disappointed <laughs> so but i i went looking it was like i i can't i need to i need i want to buy the book right now uh so if that's if you're like me the physical book for at least for kinning uh would would might work for you but i again the great audiobook readings are always appreciated um and so do check out audio i like audiobooks too so i i would recommend still checking them out nonetheless <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to follow up on um, the history question that Sean had asked um, mm -hmm. specifically um, on a narrative level one of the things that I think is most interesting about um, both Everfair and Kinning um, and especially Kinning in this sense is the idea that there is an obviously utopian world building goal that people have uh, in their minds but the story is about how that goal is very difficult to achieve because of the machinations of certain people, even people who otherwise do strongly have that goal in mind, um, will often uh, seek to claim power or seek to control the ability for other people to gain power in that world. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of um, how the two siblings at the core mm. of the story of Everfair are still essentially representatives of a state that is fostering very positive ideals mm. uh, politically in the overall world at that time, but are still struggling to determine which one of them deserves to be the ruler of their kingdom um, in a way that I thought was particularly interesting. Like, how do we navigate both having capital U utopian goals and still struggling with the desire for power or other people's desire for power. And I wanted to uh, pick your brain about that as well. Like, what was the um, narrative and political value of telling the story of those kind of warring personalities within those characters? So for me, the idea of utopia begs the question, who's utopia? Because some of us want a utopia that's like, I get to stay at home with my cat and, you know, people bring me flowers and food and, and then other people are like, my utopia involves everybody coming out of their house at the same time and clasping hands and singing a song, a rousing song. There are different there are different um, ideas of what a utopia is. So right away, even before you um, get people um, confronting one another about these ideas, they're different. And then you may have a struggle with like, no, that's not utopia. Here, have mine. Uh, and, and that um, I think is a very realistic way of depicting utopia. Um, I can see, you know, how this could be resolved, but I'm not going to tell you until the third book. <laughs> Aha. Uh -huh. You heard it you heard it here uh first folks. Definitely uh by the entire trilogy now. You are now bound <laughs> to that. <laughs> well, I love that you mentioned uh you know that the the complexities of trying to establish any kind of utopian vision. Uh, which K 
can be affected by all manners of ways in which people are raised or grow up or the political philosophy they subscribe to. And that makes for, you know, like sometimes science fiction can get a criticism for like, oh, they magically made all of the, the, the planet, all the countries are friends now and they made a planetary <laughs> government and everything works just fine. Uh, and I think to some degree, Kidding kind of shows that this is a much more murky and difficult process. And it's not as simple as just getting people to agree. It can take, you know, as Brandon's pointing out, a lot of power dynamics and relations that can get very complicated, even deeply personal. Uh, and and I, I guess, Winston, why do you have to do this to me right now? You ridiculous creature. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> for those who are listening at the podcast version, Winston has made an appearance because he wants to be held. And, and mid sentence, he decided to cross my face. Uh, so, <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Um, and I guess to some degree, would you see there's this concept in utopian studies, which is like the critical utopia, and like the text everyone cites is the dispossessed. And I don't know if you see this work as m maybe somewhat engaging in that idea of a critical utopia. I I'm curious Absolutely. where you would see. Okay. Absolutely, yes. And I've read um, The Dispossessed twice. And um, I also think that it, it's, um, I think that we need a different word for uh, the process of utopying or something like that. Um, because it's not that it's uh, an unworthy goal. It's something that uh, creating utopia is something that we we want to do we as humans it's 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 part of our practice it's it's what we do um but just to think that it the work is ever actually finished is a little problematic yeah a little yeah well i, I mean it, it dawns on me too that a part of that is if you take the world of Eva Fair and Kinning as your example, I mean, surely in creating any utopia from any framework, someone's point of view gets lost in that conversation because it doesn't fit a specific vision. And I don't know, can you imagine a, a utopian future in which all points of view are equally represented? I don't I don't know if that's uh, that I seems can. to me <laughs> you can. You think that's possible? You can. Oh. I'm now that's why I'm, I'm, third that's book. Why I'm writing the third book. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I am I very am... intrigued now because okay. I was going to follow up on Sean's statement. Like the, a, a lot of the conflict of utopianizing a space or as uh, Trifidi Matz mentions in chat, the potential uh, word that we can use is utopia. Um, uh, the, Inherent conflict is that you can even agree with other people about a political goal and the means by which it can be accomplished can be various widely different means throughout all of those uh, communities in ways where uh, finding the way to uh, pursue a course of action can be a source of conflict uh, throughout those spaces and that leads to... Um, uh, a breakdown in communication that makes continuing that project harder. Um, yeah. And the idea now that there is a way in which you can have your disagreement and solve the problem too is actually really appealing to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's ultimately appealing to the world as well. Like everybody, like it it reads to me that the world in the sense that the world is a character um wants to be complete in that sense it wants everybody to get what they want um but because there are different political factions that may or may, or may not seek the um the same goals um the struggle is how do we get those things to come together and i'm very curious to see what that will look like in the third book as a result like how do you how do you beat colonialism and still let Europeans be your allies? Like I'm oh. curious. <laughs> oh well, um, I will just say that uh, again, reading uh, reviews that I should not have read. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, someone uh, said that um, 
well, this whole fungus thing reads like horror to me. It doesn't read like utopia at all. And I'm like, yep, yeah, you got it, girl. <laughs> that oh, is the effect that I was going for. It is for some people, it is horror. Um, and some people even on the same side uh, in, in uh, pinning their like, yes, I want to join your revolution. No, I am not snorting that. No. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so, um, you know, I'm along with you for this ride, but I'm not getting on the horse, basically. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like you're saying, um, we have the same goals, but how are we going to achieve that? That yeah. is where we differ. And this... I wanted to read, um, sorry, I wanted to read, um, because we're talking about the means to the end. Um the the big fat clue that I put as a as a, a statement at the beginning of the book um, was the the Wikipedia quote: "Anarchists of the May Fourth Movement refused to distinguish between means and ends, holding that the process of revolution lay in the creation of the future society in the present." That's mm -hmm. that's that's how you resolve that issue. You mush together means and ends. I must yeah. say, I, I don't know that if you've ever had an author just throw like a bombshell statement about a book that isn't out yet that made me more <laughs> excited for that book. Uh, <laughs> because what you just did was so one of my favorite things in science fiction, and, and uh, maybe this will lead to a question or a thought from you, um, is like the book that's trying to do something, even if it doesn't succeed, it's just trying to do something different or trying to push the envelope on some concept or some idea and taking it to its logical conclusion or illogical one if you're Philip K. Dick, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> and once you tell me that you're trying to answer this question, you're trying to imagine a possible solution, that very idea to me already is super exciting. I, I mean, I just want to see that because that makes me go, okay, I want to, this is what the so much great science fiction does is it asks a question and then it tries to offer an answer. And even when the answer is bananas, it still can be <laughs> super interesting to read and see how people approach those questions quite seriously. Uh, and so I don't know if that's how you think of science fiction or genre fiction more broadly, but uh, when when I think uh, you're just you just made me feel so excited. I feel uh, like a little jittery inside right now. I, I it's not even out yet, and I want it. <laughs> yeah, it's not even written yet, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but you still know the answer. That intrigues us even more. Uh, but I'm I'm 68 years old, so hmm, am I gonna make it? Hmm. I I think I think so. We're gonna make you make it. <laughs> oh. <well. laughs> I'm uh, adding you no. to my prayers every night. <laughs> uh, Everfair took six years to write. Kinning took six years to write. You do the math. That I is have to believe that that's six years of things becoming so sharp and perfect that when <laughs> we get it, it will be, uh, it will blow our minds. I hope so. Yeah. Well, that leads me to a question, actually. So this is great because... <laughs> The uh, Everfair came out in 2016. Uh, this It's now 2024. Uh, hard to believe it's 2024. We're a, a quarter, a quarter into a new century, people. I just want you to think about that for a minute. If you thought that you were young, anybody at home. Um, <laughs> but you mentioned that it took you six years to write. Uh, and I guess like in that, that's a, that is a hard, long span of time for writing. And so... Originally, my question was, you know, how what was it like coming back? But since I now I know you, you were kind of working on it through that whole period. Uh, I guess this is more a process question of how how exactly do you write when you're kind of putting a, together a work like this? Is this just like a slow plotting kind of thing, or is it chaos and then it becomes reason at some point? What does that process look like? It is very slow. Um. <clears throat> And actually, um, I did not start writing this. Uh, I did not start writing Kinning immediately upon the publication or even 
upon the turning in of the manuscript for Everfair because I was told that there was no interest in a sequel by the publisher. They're wrong. But they changed their mind when um, the Black Panther movie came out. Oh. Mm -hmm. Suddenly they were like, oh, yeah, wait a minute. You know what? Yeah, maybe there is some interest in seeing a territory <laughs> in Africa be rec reclaimed by its community. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder, yeah. could anything have told us that this is a thing that people wanted before? Hmm. Hmm. So, yeah, so... As far as the process, um, I am a very, very slow writer. I am not one of those writers um, that I hear about all the time who like, you know, just go blah and get it out on the page and then they can fix it. That is not me. Um, I, I will rewrite it. I will try and fix it. Um, but I have to be happy enough with what I'm writing to put it on the screen um, before before I move on. Um, and I think the most I've written in one day, and as far as word count, is 800 words. Uh, generally, it's between 300 and 500. So yeah, it's very slow, like uh, Anthony Trollope uh, slow. I, uh, Anthony Trollope was a Victorian uh, novelist, yeah very slow um i mean 300 is still very manageable a day it, it is if you keep grinding seven days a week which i do which i do mm -hmm. um i won't necessarily be writing days that i'm traveling because that takes a lot out of me um or days when i'm like presenting at a conference or something like that but Otherwise, no excuse. I'm there. I'm doing it. It's interesting. Let me tell you, that was a challenge during these uh, lockdown years. Whoa. Oh, yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah. Especially considering that, I guess, a question I'll ask as a follow-up, if you feel comfortable answering that kind of question, was whether um, reckoning with the influenza as a plot in Kenning was a thing that uh, emerged as a result of the pandemic or became more complicated as a result of the pandemic, or if you were already kind of through that phase of the story um, by the time that had happened? Well, I had started um, with the influenza um, elements uh, in Everfair um, well before we had any inkling that there was going to be a, <clears throat> excuse me, that there was going to be a pandemic. Um, well before that. Um, so what happened was um, I, in, with Kinning, I realized, oh, this is kind of resonant with that. But where I really had to think about things and change them was um, one of the people in my critique group pointed out that in an earlier version of Kinning, I had a Chinese woman, Bilung, distributing a spore for, you know, what could be seen as a disease. And it could be seen as um, sort of a metaphor for um, the the Wuhan lab version of, of COVID. Um, so especially as in earlier versions, there was a lot less consent. So, yeah, that, that, is... that, that I had to change that. That is interesting because, uh, you know, to some degree, people are going to read any work, even if it was, you know, like the, the books that came out kind of like the year after COVID, if it featured anything vaguely pandemic-y, everyone's going to interpret it within that context. Yeah. Even if it was written two or three years prior, right? And I guess what, what kind of what we're hearing from you is that when you were working on Kinning, you suddenly became aware that how you told the story could have an impact you didn't intend. And yes. thus you had to make an adjustment accordingly, which 
is a very interesting thing to hear an author say because you wanted to make a different point and you had to make that more clear in adjusting the way this narrative uh, resulted. Yeah, yeah. And I also, um, I had to do a few things um, to make Bilung more um, more sympathetic um, because early versions of her, everyone saw her as a villain and I'm like, what? No. She's just a pharmacist. Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just a lowly pharmacist. No big deal. <laughs> I mean, you're, you, I, uh, again, uh, to the point of how do we frame the story for the reader, the book is coming out after a period where a large portion of uh, the population did, in fact, see all pharmacists as enemies. So... <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, engaging kind of deeply with how do I ensure that my intention uh, reads properly for a reader uh, who is coming in with their own experiences and their own biases is actually uh, the kind of thing, as Sean said, most write most writers don't ever actually publicly acknowledge, and when they do, oh. it's like, nope, that's not. I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to you the way that it occurred in my brain, no matter what. And it's like, <laughs> I get. Like I, I feel like there is tremendous value as uh uh writers and readers knowing that there are writers who are that thoughtful and will confess to being that thoughtful on a regular basis. Well, like I said, just the reader is part of the story. This is yeah. what I tell my students, right? When you're writing and even just like a, a nonfiction essay, an argument, you have to think about who your intended audience is. Right? Yeah. You have to respond to them. You can't just write how you think in your head because not everybody's going to be receptive in the same way. You have yeah. to think about them. Yeah. And normally we, I, I mean, I say normally, often we don't hear this com coming from fiction writers, even if it is part of some writers' processes as it is in yours. So perhaps that's something we do need to think about in conversations about writing and like writing workshops as making that a part of the conversation is really think about the reader and how elements of your story may be received based on what's going on in the world. That may be a thing. There's a, there's like a sensitive way to address that, that I'm not equipped to have, but <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what, what's coming. The, the world is in a weird state <laughs> lately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I say lately, like basically my entire life, it's just getting more ridiculous in some respects. So yeah. But any uh, so oh. I wanted to, <laughs> so I wanted to come back to um, uh, the conversation about how long how long it had taken you to um, uh, work on these books, um, in particular because you had also commented on the effort that is required to keep track of the history that you had created for this world in comparison to um real history, and I was kind of curious all of a sudden how much of that process was actually the process of um reading um historical texts taking your own notes uh like how much of that time was actually just about getting the timeline to the point where you wanted it and not necessarily just about the act of writing the work itself huh i um well first of all i want to say um that and sort of related although it's not necessarily the answer to your question, I was, I had actually written three other, three other sequels, let's see, Falconization, Slippernet, four other sequels to Everfair, um, short stories. Ah. These are things that happen um, mostly between the end of Everfair and the beginning of Kinning. Um, so um, there's, a short story. I think they're coming up on tour now. One of them's already up there. Um, uh, let's see. Those were um, what were those? Boy, being old, I tell you, I need, I need, I need a new brain. Um, one of them was uh, Sun River, and one of them was The Colors of Money. And Sun River, I'm pretty sure, is up at Tor.com or Reactor, as we're calling it, right now. 
Um, and then uh, Vulcanization um, is a sequel sort of, it's it's a horror story from Leopold's viewpoint. And um, oh. I have definitely kept Leopold off the stage. Um, you know, he was not on the page at all. Uh, and then I did this short story from his viewpoint and it was nasty. I like had to scrub down afterwards, just being in that head, you know, um, he used the N word profligately. Um, and then uh, the final one, um, uh, it was called Slippernet. And that set sort of after the end of Truly's. <laughs> Oh, that's oh, oh. that should be an evil cackle there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, mm. uh, yeah, Slippernet, and that is uh, going to be on on tor .com slash reactor also. Um, so, uh -huh. so I I guess my point is that I had not strayed too far from thinking about this world. Uh, this was it was it was still in my mind now as far as the research was I trying to put together a timeline now no I um I am of the school of people who you know I write a little I research a little I research a little I write a little I go back and forth I'm able to do that without falling down research rabbit holes um I also don't do the thing where you know you put like uh all caps text and say and then a miracle occurs and you go on with the rest of the story um because i have to know what miracle because it might change you know the next chapter or the next paragraph or the next page so i yeah going back and forth um for the desired Effect, looking for what happens, looking for what that means, looking for how it plays out, and then what would come next. Does that answer the question? I think so. It does. Yeah. Okay. It's a great answer. And I've put the those links, they'll be in the show notes to the stories, uh, Sun River Vulcanization and Slippernet, which I think was originally on Slate, or at least Slate has an article mentioning it. Yeah, yeah. The story. Yeah, it was. Um, and then presumably it'll be on Reactor, which you'd mentioned. So uh, people will have that. It's in chat, and it's also going to be in the show notes for the show, so folks can go read those and also buy eight thousand copies of Kim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh well, okay. So we we kind of need to wind down. Um, I'm sure we could ask you many more questions, but you have a life, and you were cooking before this, if if I understood <laughs> stove before. So you might have some form of food to consume. Uh, so let's start with our wind down questions. And one of them is one that uh, you, you may be able to talk about or not, which is what are you working on next that you are allowed to tell us about? <laughs> oh, well, I'm doing uh, revisions and updates to writing the other, a practical approach, the oh. book uh, on writing the other. Um, so that's what I'm working on that I can talk about. Um, uh, I just finished uh, receiving the proofs of um, a short story called, um, see, this is this is where I lose track of, of the titles again. Um, oh, um, over a long time ago which is a line from my favorite band, Steely Dan. Shout out to Steely Dan. <laughs> um, over a long time ago, uh, it's part of this series of short stories I wrote about a uh, interstellar prison colony. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so that one's going to be up on Nightmare in May. Um, and then in September, I believe, I you know, the further away from the election night, the better. But uh, <laughs> but in September, uh, Rosarium is going to publish my Beat Era fantasy novella. Um, let me take a minute to talk about that. Uh, so you all know who Jack Kerouac 
was, right? Mm -hmm. Jack Kerouac uh, fictionalized his life. That was how he made his bread. So one of his novels, The Subterraneans, is about his fling with a Black woman. Um, in the book, he called her Mardu Fox. Her real name was Aileen Lee. She was an author. She was just as good, if not better, an author than Jack Kerouac. But of course, Black woman, not going to get published in like 1952, right? You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, my book is called The Day and Night Books of Mardu Fox. And it's a series of journal entries by Aileen Lee, uh, inspired by Aileen Lee, um, who about her interactions with Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac and Gregory Corso and all those people. Oh. And also magic. I never, I'm very intrigued by this. I'm very curious too. I'd never heard of Aileen Lee before and now I want to go read everything I can about her. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, you look her up. I think she has a Wikipedia article and there's a couple other things. And there's some writing samples. Good stuff. Ooh, and of okay. course, she hated what Jack wrote about her. Oh. <laughs> he I mean, Lee has a Wikipedia page that is literally three sentences long. Yeah. That's Most how of upset it is about... I am so very yeah. upset. Almost all of it is about Jack Kerouac. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there are some links there that may may lead to some more infer information, which I will be pulling up immediately because uh, I'm very curious. Mm -hmm. So, so thank you for giving so, me both. So we're going to look out for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and right, of course, question. our second question is: uh, Where can folks find you on the internet and elsewhere? Uh, I am really taken with Blue Sky these days. Yeah, y'all y'all found me on Blue Sky too, right? Yeah. yeah. It's it's um it's a lot of fun right now. I don't know if the fun will last, but it is fun. Um and I I have uh, I have an Instagram account with which I do basically diddly squat and um Facebook. Yeah. You you also and have I, a web page. Yeah, but come on. I think <laughs> the last copyright uh on there was from like 2017 or something. Oh. It's 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 I need to update that thing. Fair, hey, fair take enough. this as invitation to do so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm great. I'm great. Oh, that's right. You you have the dark matter on there. Oh, I love that collection. It's so good. Matter so good. Sorry, I'm on your website website and I was looking to I just quickly scrolled down the, oh, oh. the title <laughs> covers and I saw Dark Matter and I was like, oh, I love that collection. It's so good. <laughs> that was put together by Cherie Renee Thomas, and that that is phenomenal work. I, I would argue mm -hmm. it's one of the top five most important collections of of literature probably ever released. Okay. I'll go with that. That's my my opinion. So nobody has to accept it, but they're they're wrong if they don't. <laughs> just I'm just teasing. <laughs> I just I, really I think it it's and great. I believe that they are wrong. Uh, <laughs> it's it's also got I believe like daughter by Tanana Rivdu in there, which is one of my favorite uh, favorite short stories ever. I I could talk about anyway. I'm sorry. I I could ramble. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, um, anyway. <laughs> in any other circumstance, we would allow Sean to ramble, but um, we should, in fact, close. So, <laughs> yeah. again, thank you so very much, Nisi, for joining us this evening. Um, we're so glad we got to talk to you about Kidding, and we are very excited for everything that you have coming next. Yay! <laughs> awesome. So, for folks at home, uh, this is just a reminder, if you've got listener thoughts, whatever, listener suggestions, skiffingfanty.com slash listener suggestions, or skiffingfanty at gmail. Dot com if you want to send us an email if you've got thoughts about the book or you just i don't know you just want to rave about how much you like Deverfair and kinning that that's fine too we'll take those um we're skiffing fanti on most places and have a newsletter and a patreon and you can just go to linktree that's l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash skiffing fanti and there's links to basically everywhere we are i'm obviously here uh tuesdays and thursdays at seven 
for non-Skiffy stuff. And then every Friday at 6.30 p.m., we have some Skiffy thing going on. So you can watch us there. And my link tree is just slash Sean Duke. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can find me almost everywhere on the internet at The Rising Tides. That's T-I-T-H-E-S. Uh, my newsletter, which is also my website at brandonobrien.xyz and at speculatorstuff.com. Perfect. All right. As required by the Skiffy Fanny bylaws, I will make this awkward now. Bye. You don't have to. No, uh, sorry. The bylaws say so. We we all agree to these bylaws, so I must make it make it incredibly awkward. Uh, I mm-hmm. am. I'm just gonna go run in the street and yell the word Leopold for no reason, just to see how the neighbors react. <laughs> you know what? I also want to know how the neighbors will react. I uh, probably get arrested. Please be safe. <laughs> Take care of yourself, please. All right, folks. And on that note, awkward ending and see. Ha <laughs> ha